Hey, welcome to episode six of the Wool Needles Hands podcast. My name is Taylor, and this is a podcast where I talk about knitting and making and getting crafty in Las Vegas, Nevada, where I'm from and where I live with my husband, Brandon, my two-year-old son, Angus, and our cat, Oscar. Oscar is actually kind of a myth at this point. One day he will come on and you will get to meet him. I will actually have a physical cat to share with you. You just have to trust me that my cat, Oscar, resides with us here. I'm so thankful to have you here, hanging out with me, spending some time. If you're a new subscriber, thank you so much for stopping by um, and taking part in this little corner of YouTube that I have here. And if you're a returning subscriber, thanks for coming back. It's so nice to have this time to spend together and chit chat about the things that we love in this fiber world. You can find all show notes for this, for every show on Ravelry in the Wool Needles Hands podcast Ravelry group. Head over there, join. There's lots going on, which I'll talk about, but our show notes are kept there. You can also find show notes down in the doobly-doo here on YouTube if you'd like to just quickly reference any that I'm talking about in the show. Um, if there's anything that I forget to put in the show notes, just send me a comment um, down below and I'll get right back to you. I respond pretty quickly. So if you have any concerns or questions, just let me know. You can also find me on Instagram as at wool needles hands. And to be completely honest, when it comes to social media, that's pretty much the platform other than Ravelry and here on YouTube that I spend most of my time. I'm more active there. I try to keep my social media platforms to a minimum. I know there's so many things out there that I could be joining, um, but if I join too many, I can't put, you know, my best effort into any of them. Um, it's just like being spread too thin. So I'm on Instagram, I'm on Ravelry, and I'm here on YouTube. You can also reach me if you want to contact me via email. My email address is woolneedleshands at gmail.com. <laughs> First things first, what am I drinking today? Well, in my, th this is the go-to mug. I haven't, I mean, I haven't bought a new mug. I found a mug that I really, really want, and I'm gonna share that with you later in the show, but this is just, it's the one I'm using right now. This is my fancy cap mug. If you've watched the show the last few episodes, you've seen this mug. Um, probably a little overkill to show it to you again, but I am having coffee this afternoon. It is, 3.05 in the afternoon here, and I'm having some coffee because I just felt like I needed a little pick-me-up, uh, something a little bit more powerful than tea, and so coffee it is. I um, The coffee that we drink here is from Sprouts. I don't know if you guys have a Sprouts market where you are, but they have really good um, bulk coffee that you can grind there. And I think this is just their breakfast blend. But yeah, I load it up with lots of cream and a little bit of Splenda, and it's good to go. So that's what I'm having today coffee. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm a little bit nervous about this hot beverage because as you can see, I am completely embellished today. And I'm going to explain to you what it is that I'm wearing in a moment. But the hot drink and this sweater is keeping me a little bit warm. So I'm going to set this over here where I have all of these flames. Do you know when you have four candles behind you, it's like having a small fire. This sweater is like having a small fire around me. So we're going to see how this goes. <laughs> All right, guys, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what I'm wearing because it is a little bit of an elephant in the room considering what I have on my head. I was going to save this for the finished object segment, but I couldn't resist to wear it to share with you guys right away. This is my Exploring in the Woods um, slouchy lace beanie that I knit for the Wool Needles Hand Spring Hat Cal 2017. Um, I'm obsessed with this hat. I loved the pattern. I loved knitting the pattern. I loved the yarn that I chose. It's in a Madeline Tosh Prairie, which is the Madeline Tosh lace weight, and it's in the color Nassau Blue. I have so much of it left. This is how much of the cake that I have left of the Madeline Tosh that I use for this hat. That's crazy. I could knit a whole pair of socks with what I have left and I might just do that. But um, but yes, I love this hat so much. If you saw it on Instagram, you kind of got a little bit more of an idea of what it looks like. Um, but yeah, it's so comfortable. It's everything that I wanted in um, a lacy spring transitional weather beret. I'm looking at myself right now on the screen just because yeah, I'm just, I'm so pleased with it. And it kind of fits on my head um, very delicately. It doesn't squinch in tightly around my head. And when you have short hair, wearing hats can become a problem if they're too tight, because if you take them off, you have really noticeable hat hair, because it gives you this like ring of hair that's smashed in. Um, if you have longer hair, sometimes you can disguise that a little bit better. So this is nice. It just lays on my head um, nicely, doesn't give me any tight 
brimage, I guess you could call that. Um, any of you with short hair might know what I'm talking about, but yes, I love it so much. Um, it is the Exploring in the Woods pattern by Melinda Vermeer, and I wanted to not only wear it just to share with you guys on the podcast, but I also wanted to remember to share with you guys a coupon code. Melinda got in touch with me because she noticed that I was talking about her pattern on the podcast, and she was generous enough to offer us a coupon code for the viewers and subscribers of the Wool Needles Hands podcast to go and um, get a discount on some of her patterns on Ravelry. So the coupon code for that is WNH25. You can get 25% of Melinda Vermeer's patterns all the way through April, through the end of this month. So get there fast, get something going. I believe this is a pay for pattern. So if you're interested in trying out this hat, um, now's the time to do it. So Melinda, if you happen to be watching this episode, thank you so much for your generous donation to the show. I can't tell you enough how much I loved this pattern. It was so much fun to knit. It was I mean, for a lace pattern, it was pretty mindless. I guess you can call that mindful because it really just allowed your mind to kind of think instead of focusing so much on the pattern, which is really uncommon for lace patterns. So I love it, you guys, and I wanted to share it with you right away. So if you're interested, head on over to Melinda's Ravelry page for her patterns and um, check out some of her patterns using that coupon code. Also, this sweater that I'm wearing, um, I'm kind of excited to share this with you. I did not make this, so we'll go ahead and get that out of the way right now. Um, but in the process of finding sweaters to unravel for the great Unravel 2017 knit along, which I'll talk to you guys about in a minute, I found this gem and I didn't find it at a thrift store. My mother, she kind of keeps all of her sweaters nicely stored in a really beautiful hutch. And she allowed me to go through the boxes of her sweaters because she said she had some in there um, that she didn't plan on wearing anymore that probably had really great fiber content for what I was looking for um, and so she allowed me to go through those and I found this sweater actually I found this and I found a couple other sweaters um, and I what I loved about it was not not the fiber in the sense that I wanted to take it out and, and re-knit it into something else, but I just love the sweater. So I'm sharing it with you today just as a, as a way of saying that in this process of looking for thrifted sweaters to unravel, you might find some beauties that you could just snatch up for a really low price. Even if you were to go to a thrift store, a sweater like this would not cost very much at all and it's a great sweater. And so I'm just wearing this to say, hey, in the process of finding fiber to knit into something new, we might just find a sweater that we can breathe new life into because even though this whole knit along is about knitting items out of thrifted sweaters, you're still doing a lot to decrease your fiber footprint just by purchasing a sweater from a thrift store and, and giving it a chance, giving it another go around. So um, that's kind of what I'm doing with this. So that's where this sweater came from. Like I said, it is a 50-40-10. It's 50% um, Angora, 40% lamb's wool, and 10% nylon. And it's got all these little embellishments. You guys, I've probably not been this embellished since maybe I I was like 10 and at Christmas time. This is crazy for me. But there's something about it that even though there's all these little gold beads everywhere, you can see that all these things are just little. It still has kind of a minimal feel to it. Somebody's out there thinking I'm crazy for saying that. So whatever, maybe it's not minimal at all, but it's black. So at least it's black. I mean, if it were like a punchy neon pink, it might be a different story. But yeah, so this is um kind of a cool diamond in the rough that I found, even though it wasn't really in the rough because my mom has a beautiful collection of um, sweaters that she's had forever. So thank you, mom, for letting me play around in this one. <laughs> Let's go ahead and just do a quick update on what we have going on right now. In the Wool Needles Hands Ravelry page, we are in the midst of the WNH Spring Hat Cal 2017, and that is where this hat came from. It is just a knit along where we are getting together some fingering weight yarn, some lace hat patterns, and knitting up some cool transitional weather hats uh, that'll get us through spring and into the days of summer for some of you that live in regions where maybe it doesn't get super hot. Um, for me, I think my days are numbered wearing this hat. It's starting to warm up pretty good around here, um, so we'll see. But it'll be a nice hat to pull out when the temperatures start to drop um, in about mid-September, uh, so I'm excited to be able to wear it again then. So that's what's going on right now. So if you guys are interested in knitting a lacy hat, something that's transitional for spring, um, head over to the Ravelry group, check out previous episodes because I talk about it um, in the last episode and in the one before that. Um, join us. We are doing this until May, so 
so you have time it didn't take me very long to knit this and I didn't rush so if you are interested jump on board and like I said you guys have a coupon code for this hat um, so if you're interested in knitting this hat for that particular knit along go for it um, use that coupon code check out Melinda's other patterns because they're really beautiful um, so yeah that's the first knit along that we have going on and at the end of the knit along once I go into the finished object thread I will be choosing randomly from those for um, the winner of the knit along and they will be receiving this beautiful project bag by Darn Yarn MN, one of her peekaboo project bags, as well as a hand dyed skein of yarn by yours truly. So those can, are things that you could win if you participate in the knit along. So if you're interested, please head on over, subscribe to the channel. You have to be a subscriber to the channel. I have to participate a little bit in the chatter thread and then of course post your finished object in the FO thread. But yeah, you have some time. So if you're interested, jump on board. The next knit along that hasn't started yet but will be starting on April 27th is the Great Unravel 2017. This is a knit along that's being hosted by myself, by Caitlin at the Wool Jewel podcast, and by Celeste from Yarn to Table. We decided to do a knit along where we find thrifted knitwear, we unravel the knitwear and use that fiber to create something different, to breathe new life into older fiber. In the previous episode, there are more details about this. Plus there is also a promotional video that I filmed for this knit along in the playlist on my YouTube channel called Knit Along Promotional Videos. So check that out. Check out Caitlin's podcast. Check out Celeste's podcast. Plus if you just head over to the Ravelry page. There are threads that are specific to this knit along. So if you are interested, um, check out our Ravelry pages, check out down below in the doobly-doo, um, check out either of our podcasts. Also Instagram, there's some information on Instagram if you follow any of us on Instagram. But it's a really exciting concept for a knit along. You're not only getting to deconstruct an item, which gives you a little bit more insight into how that item is created, strengthening your skill set as a knitter, you're also going to be repurposing that yarn up cycling that fiber and so it's a really cool way to like I mentioned earlier um, decrease your fiber footprint a little bit find some more information and join because you have plenty of time it goes from April 22nd to June 17th. We'd love to have you join. So if you're interested at all, if it's something you've been wanting to do, please take this opportunity. The more, the merrier. It is really exciting to see everybody getting involved in this. There is an international group of people involved in this knit along right now. I had a comment on Instagram from somebody who was in Japan looking for sweaters to unravel for this knit along. And it's just gonna be really inspiring to see all of the things that people come up with. There is also a prize on each of our Ravelry pages. So you actually have three chances to win a prize with this knit along. So all you have to do is enter your finished object into each of our FO threads on Ravelry. And I believe that Caitlin might be offering a couple different prizes, but either way you have three chances to win. And here at the Wool Needles Hands podcast, you have a chance of winning this beautiful skein of naturally dyed yarn by Blue Sheep Yarn Co. This is dyed using buckthorn berry. It's a light fingering weight yarn, 375 yards, two and a half ounces. Um, it's gorgeous and so squishy soft. She was also generous enough to include a tie dye project bag that is dyed using indigo blue dye. All of her dyes are harvested um, in the area where she is. She's in Cortland, New York, and all of her dyes are um, created from items that are harvested, grown and harvested in her region. Um, I love the zipper. So you have an opportunity to win this if you enter your finished object into the finished object thread on any of our, well, on my Ravelry page, you can win this, but there are other prizes that you can win on the other podcasters Ravelry pages as well. So that is um, here, Wool Needles Hands podcast, Caitlin from the Wool Jewel podcast, and Celeste from Yarn to Table. So please check it out. We'd love to have you. The more the merrier. Also, Jessie from Blue Sheep Yarn Co. was generous enough to give us a coupon code for her Etsy shop for all the way through the month of May. The code is Wool Needles Sheep, and you can receive 15% off. Pop quiz, everyone. I have another coupon code from Melinda Vermeer that I'd like to share with you guys. But the way you can win this coupon code, which is a whopping $10 off any collection of her patterns, you have to answer a question. The question is, where did the Kitchener stitch originate? If you can answer that question correctly and be the first person to not only be a subscriber, but also add the comment down below, you will win the coupon code for $10 off any combination of her designs. So I don't 
don't have a whole lot to share with you guys in regards to the Make 9 2017 challenge. I thought that maybe I would have something sewn up to share with you guys today, but with Vogue Knitting Live, the Great Unravel 2017 promo videos and some tutorials I've been filming, I didn't quite have the time that I wanted to do that. I'm going to be starting cutting my fabric as soon as we wrap this here today. I'm actually going to go down there and start cutting fabric, but I don't have anything to share with you guys in that department yet, but stay tuned. It is coming and I'm so excited. In the meantime, however, I do have an acquisition that I'm just going to go ahead and share with you here because it is directly um, related to my Make 9 2017 challenge and my new sewing endeavors. And it is a sewing planner that I picked up on the Colette Patterns website. It's a really cool, it's kind of got a spiral bound um, spine and it's a journal kind of it's I mean it's it's a planner but it's almost like a journal um, where you can keep information about your sewing and so you can see here there's pages of like survey questions where it asks you some of your favorite like fabrics your favorite design elements and clothes and then it gives you separate sections for each of the seasons um, where you can keep a log of the different things that you've worked on. It has pages um, like this one, where it shows um, your goals, your sewing goals for particular projects, um, gives you some places for notes, you can have a place for like an inspiration board, some color palettes that you might be interested in. And I mean, it goes on and on. Um, for each of the different seasons. And then it gives you project pages where you can put your project name, information about the project you'll be working on, and then it has a page for graph paper um, if you have any sketches of the item that you're planning on sewing. So I got this. I feel like this is definitely something maybe a more veteran sewist would be interested in, but I got it because I really like to organize projects that I'm working on when I have a lot of them coming in the lineup. And so I organize my, my works in progress in my notebook, kind of the various different ones that I'm working on. And you know what, Katie from Inside Number 23 has an amazing, um, it's not a bullet journal, but it's a journal where she keeps track of all of the pro uh, projects projects that she's working on and I love what she's doing over there. So if you haven't checked out um, her most recent episodes, I think it's maybe two episodes ago that she shares that. Um, I really like what she's doing with that with her handwriting and her really pretty tape that she uses on her pages. Um, this is just kind of like that. It's just a place where I can keep my patterns that I'm going to be working on organized. Plus it was just really inspiring when I saw it. I thought that would be kind of a cool inspiring way to keep things interesting throughout the Make 9 2017 challenge. So that's all I really have to share with you guys in regards to that challenge um, today. So I don't know if you guys have anything like this. Um, if you have other techniques that you use to organize your works in progress or your sewing patterns, let me know. Um, this is just one thing that I have, but I know other people have really cool ways of doing that and bullet journals are really popular right now. Things kind of like that um, for organizing the projects that you're working on. So I'd be interested to know what you guys use. But that's all I have for this today. As an educator, I've always appreciated crafts and working with your hands and anything that involves manipulating things with your hands. There's something about the problem solving aspect in that, um, that and, and the repetitive nature of working with your hands that can really lend itself to mathematical thinking, um, problem solving, and so on and so forth. And I remember when I was teaching fourth graders and even when I was teaching in the gifted and talented program, um, incorporating building or crafting was always a really big part of the way that I taught. And so when I found this particular article that I want to share with you guys today, it really kind of struck a chord with me um, in that regard. It's a project, and I, I'm looking down at my paper, I want to make sure I get her title correct. It's a project that Melissa Grisolfi, who's an associate professor of math education at the Peabody College of Education at Vanderbilt University, um, she has created. It's called Knit Lab, and it's a project that includes things like after school workshops for children can come and they can learn how to knit. Working with their hands and developing the skills that are required of a knitter to kind of hone mathematical skills and mathematical thinking and, and um, problem solving strategies. And I thought that was really interesting. We all know as being knitters or crocheters um, or, or cross stitchers or weavers or anybody who has to manipulate fiber um, and, and using a pattern or even creating a pattern, there's so much problem solving 
solving that goes into that, um, problem solving, troubleshooting, and fixing your mistakes, that to imagine teaching these things to children, not only to increase their mental capacity for mathematics, but also to increase their level of patience in dealing with problems, the level of um, perseverance in solving problems or figuring out what went wrong in a particular design. I think that there's so much to be said for that. And so this particular project Grisolfi's working on, I think, expounds on that. So in this project, Grisolfi is hoping that after four years of this project being underway, she's hoping to illuminate the usefulness of handicrafts when it comes to mathematical thinking and problem solving in children. And anytime I hear about, you know, knitting and, and fiber arts in the mainstream media, I get excited, but anytime I hear about it being embraced in education as a form of helping students to understand concepts, I get even more excited because I do feel like handicrafts and just you building and constructing with our hands is not explored enough in a public education setting, and I think it ought to be. You know, there's so much possibility for problem solving and mathematical thinking in those areas, and especially with the movement in schools towards what's called STEM, which is uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics we should be working along these lines. We should be incorporating fiber arts. We should be incorporating engineering in the sense of designing and constructing. Um, and, and fiber arts is, is exactly like that. If you're designing a knitting pattern, you're creating a blueprint. And then when you're sampling, when you're test knitting your pattern, you're constructing your design and you're finding mistakes and you're figuring out how to fix those mistakes. And so it's just, it's all a part of that. And so this is exciting to me because it's just one step in that direction. Another thing that uh, the article goes on to talk about is how Grisolfi is focusing a lot um, in this project on girls, young girls who tend to have higher levels of math anxiety. She feels like this is another way to reach out to those individuals and help them with these mathematical concepts and you know eliminating any math anxiety as well. I thought that was interesting. I thought I would share it with you. If you want more information about this particular project or about the article that I used to get this information, look down in the doobly-doo. There are show notes down there and I link to this article right there. Um, so if you want to, you can just click on it and check out more about this story. <music> Okay, so I had plans of sharing with you not only this finished object, but um, my stripey socks. I hadn't been knitting on them for the last week because of some other things I've been focusing on. I wanted to get this done. I was really spending so much time knitting this because I really wanted to wear it at Vogue Knitting Live, which didn't happen, um, but that's okay. So I wasn't giving as much love to my other projects, which meant that my stripey socks, which are for Candace's stripey socks knit along from Pin Feathers and Pearls, which was extended into April, which I'm really thankful about for you know, just knowing that I'm going to have enough time to get these finished, which when you see my second sock, because the first one is already done, you'll think that it's ridiculous. I didn't just whip this thing up right before I started filming, but I didn't. Anyway, moving on. My first work in progress is my sock number two of my stripey socks. And there it is. You can see that this sucker is pretty much done. I am literally just decreasing for the toe. And then I'm going to put a Kitchener stitch in this and be done. So had I just been a little bit more diligent, I would have gotten this done to show you guys on the podcast, but I didn't. So there it is. So keep your eyes out on Instagram. This thing is going to be there anytime now. Um, as soon as we get done recording, I'm going to finish it just because this is ridiculous. This should be in the faux section, not in the whip section, but what can you do? <laughs> All right, you guys, that sweater had to go. I was so hot, I couldn't, I could hardly stand it. So bye-bye, Angora and lamb's wool sweater. Another day, maybe, when it's 25 degrees here. Anyway, as I was saying, this thing will be done later today. So I'm gonna just go ahead and put this back in its project bag where it has been living and where it will soon be vacating. Um, for something new. The project bag I'm keeping this in is another Darn Yarn MN project bag, one of the peekaboo bags, which I love so much. My favorites, cute handle, just the best. Okay, my next work in progress, which is living in this adorable little project bag that was gifted to me from my best friend, Lauren. Um, this actually came from, I believe, Cost Plus World Market. Um, it's just a cool like cosmetic style bag, but it's super roomy. And as you can see, 
living in, and I haven't worked on these since, I think I may have worked on these a little bit since I recorded last. Um, let me just remove the Angora from my face. But um, I haven't given these much love for the reasons I spoke about before. But anyway, these are my, I'm calling these my February socks. I know it's not February, but I'm knitting these out of long dog yarn um, in the February colorway, and that's why I'm calling them my February socks. So here they are, probably what you remember if you watched the previous episode. This yarn is amazing though, so it's worth showing again. This is long dog yarn. This is the February colorway, and this is the fig colorway, and they are just gorgeous together. So beautiful. I have my little flamingo progress keeper on there, but yeah, I love this so much. I can't wait to get going on this. Now that my stripy socks are pretty much done, I'll be able to give some more love to these guys. I'm knitting these on carbons, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with carbons. I'm sure you are, but they are really, really fun DPNs to knit with. I love the texture of the shaft of the needle. Um, the stitches are, they just run along the needle so nice and smoothly. So nice and smooth. Smooth, they run along the needle smoothly. There we go. The way that the needle is constructed, this is a carbon fiber needle shaft, and I believe it is a stainless steel or an aluminum tip. You can correct me, but I'm pretty sure this is carbon fiber, but I don't know, they're really cool to work with, have a good texture, good quality needle. So yeah, loving these. And as you can see, I'm not knitting these two at a time. I wasn't knitting my stripy socks two at a time. I feel like I maybe have been standing on that soapbox for too long. Crazy dog outside. So I'm not knitting these two at a time. That's just what's going on with me right now. Two at a time is on a hiatus. These are my February socks. And here are the, the cakes of yarn for each of the colorways. This is the February colorway. Gorgeous. Absolutely love Brandy's yarn. Long dog yarn is lovely. And then this is the fig colorway. Another very luxurious yarn. So pretty. And that is my February socks. I've made so little progress on my Find Your Fade shawl since the last time I shared it with you. I'm just gonna briefly show this to you, talk a little bit about it and then move on. Um, because until I have more progress to show you, why spend all the time here when we can talk about other things? Okay, so here is my Find Your Fade shawl. I'll just, uh, you know, there's really no good way to show this when it's on the needles that does it justice, to be completely honest. So I'm just going to show you the newest section I've been working on. Let's see. So this, the copper color that you're seeing here is a local yarn, a local dyer here in Las Vegas. The yarn is called Twist, and this is her Luke and Lorelei colorway, a nod to the Gilmore Girls. And the color right before that is Lichen and Lace, or Lichen and Lace, however you'd like to pronounce it. Um, I love how you can see the coppery tones in this colorway and how those are picked up in this copper colorway up here. I think that they go really, really well together. I can't wait to kind of see the color expand and see how it goes with the rest of the shawl. And when I finished the hat that I'm wearing and I had all of that yarn left over, I kept thinking to myself, could I fit that color in my shawl somewhere? I don't know. Looking at what I have right now, I just think that it would be a very garish addition to the colors here, but I wanna show you the next color I have in my Find Your Fade lineup, and then you can kind of tell me what you think. Okay, so here is what I have so far, like I just showed you. And then the next colorway that I'm going to be adding to this is this one here. And it's really kind of hard to imagine what this would look like at this point, just because I don't have a lot of that copper going on right now. Um, but you can kind of get an idea of what might be happening with this um, as I add this new color. This is Wildflowers by Lichen and Lace. And it's gorgeous. I can't wait to see what this looks like when it's all knitted up. But in this, you can actually see a little bit of that blue from the Madeline Tosh that I have for my hat kind of coming through right there. And so I've been playing with the idea of figuring out how to incorporate this in my Find Your Fade shawl. So we're to go together. Can you imagine? Oh gosh, I don't know. Now that I'm looking at it, I think it might be too much. Yeah, I don't know. You can tell me what you think. Does it look like a hot mess? You know, I probably should just stop trying so hard to incorporate this into something else because I love it so much. It will come. Whatever this is meant for, it will come. Let me know what you think. 
Do you think I should put this in my Find Your Fade just because I love it so much? Do you actually think it looked good? You would be completely honest, completely honest. Let me know what you guys think. All right, my next work in progress is rather unconventional, but because we're doing the Great Unravel 2017 knit along, it's actually pretty appropriate. What I have right here are the pieces of my sweater that I will be using for the Great Unravel 2017 knit along. I haven't unraveled this, but I have taken the sweater apart. So here are the different pieces. This is a sleeve that's been taken apart. The seams where I, um, all of the seams at this point look like this. So you can see that the seams still look like they are seamed in some way. And that's because I still need to take out one final um, crochet seam that I have posted a tutorial. I use that word carefully because it's not a tutorial in the sense that I know exactly what I'm doing and I'm an expert and this is how you should go about unseaming or unzipping your sweater seams. It's more of a demonstration on how I did it. So you can check that out if you've yet to unzip seams of a sweater and you would like some inspiration, maybe a place to go so you know what you're getting yourself into. Plus it does provide information that will help you check that out. It is how I do it unzipping sweater seams. That's kind of where I talk about how I did this, how I unzip this sweater seam. If you have any other methods um, that would work for that, that maybe would be easier, leave them in the comments of that particular video. Comments are a good source of information just like the videos are, so you know, feel free. But this is what I've done so far. And as I'm looking at this, yeah, so as I'm looking at this even now, I'm noticing that my sleeves the cuffs of the sleeves, I don't know if you can see this here, but the cuffs of the sleeves are seamed. So these sleeves are separate. So I still need to take out this crocheted seam here and separate these cuffs. So, you know, it's funny, cause when you do this, as you pull the sweater apart and you really start to see how the sweater is constructed and it's and it's interesting I don't know, it's just kind of cool to see the actual construction of a hand knit sweater so one of my goals in the coming days is to number one unravel this i do plan on posting a demonstration another how i do it on unraveling this and then i also want to wash and prep the fiber here because i do plan on dyeing this i'm not exactly sure what color um it is a yellow yarn already as it is um so whatever i dye this will be something that kind of complements that I don't know if that's the right word to use when it comes to color theory, but something that works well with this um, that won't be, create a muddy color. So I'm excited to do that. I will be documenting that and sharing it on my next installment of the Making Progress vlog. So that is coming up, but this is a work in progress, as you can see. Um, on the knit along, we do ask that you take a before picture of whatever it is that you're going to be unraveling. And I already broke that rule. I don't have a before picture of this sweater, but I do have the pieces. Um, but of course I can't enter into the knit along which is totally fine. This is my before of my great Unravel 2017 project. The fiber is an Angora wool blend and there's a little bit of nylon in here as well. I think the nylon was just the filament used in the cuffs and the collar which I removed. You can see that it has a really pretty halo. I think you might be able to see that there. Really nice halo, very very soft. Um, luxurious feeling yarn. I have a few other sweaters. I have this sweater. I'm, sh I'm crumpling it up because really I'm just showing you the fiber. So this is a sweater that was purchased with a pretty um, Angora blend as well. I believe this one might have alpaca in it. So there is this one. Um, which I have not finished taking apart completely because I am at a point where I'm not sure what to do next. So I just have to take some time and, and look at it carefully. And then I also have this sweater, which I did post this sweater on Instagram. Um, it is pure new wool. The wool was sheared and spun in Scotland and the sweater was constructed in Ireland. Um, and I thought that was really cool. 100% pure Shetland wool spun in Scotland, made in Ireland. Um, this is the label. Really cool. I don't know, I love, I just love that. You can tell it's an older sweater, um, but cool. So the problem that I had with this one, however, was that once I started to pull or unzip the seams of the sides of the sweater, I got all the way up to the uh, sleeves of the sweater and then I realized, whoops, the sleeves are surged, not um, sewn closed using a crochet chain. You might be able to see here 
that these are serged seams. Not the right kind of seam for this project. Um, I will still be able to use majority of the fiber from this sweater. I just have to make some accommodations, snip away some seams, and things will be fine. I might lose a little bit, but that's okay. At least I get to use some of it. And this is also a pretty yellow, so however I managed to over dye the previous sweater I showed you, I'll probably use a similar technique for over dyeing this because they're the same color, essentially. That's what I have so far um, in the way of sweaters. I will be unraveling for fiber. I'm not gonna be using all of those to knit something um, for this particular project, but I, I will have that fiber to kind of keep in my stash. If you're getting involved in this and you are finding that the first sweater that you pull from a thrift store and bring home doesn't really work out, welcome to the club. I unzipped or at least attempted to unzip the seams of five sweaters before I had a sweater that I could actually film a tutorial with. Now the sweaters that I tried to unzip aren't unusable at this point. They just were really difficult for me to manage because I didn't understand the construction of the sweater um, well enough to be able to unzip everything the way I was supposed to unzip it. To, to get the pieces to come apart easily. So if the process is complicated for you, if you're having some issues or you're finding that you did, oh, I didn't think about that. I didn't think about what to do with a button band. I didn't notice that those seams were surged. I didn't notice that a shawl collar would be such a complicated design element on a sweater to unzip. You are not alone. And this is all part of the process I'm learning. So, you know, none of us are pros. I don't know if, are there any professional sweater unzippers? You know, sweater taker aparters? You know, I don't think so. So if you're having a hard time if you're struggling ask questions on the thread because there are some people there that do have some insight um, comment down below but yeah you're definitely not alone this is definitely a, a challenging process I went through five sweaters to find the one that I knew would probably work out well for filming and even when I filmed my how I do it for unzipping sweater seams I wasn't 100% sure how that was gonna work out because it's not like you can unzip all the sweater seams and then put it back together and do it again so you kind of go into it blind just you know keep that in mind I'm putting that out there it hasn't been a piece of cake it wasn't a walk in the park from the get-go so hopefully that kind of puts your mind at ease that we are all experiencing similar issues <laughs> wanted to be able to share my stripey socks with you finished completed in this segment but as you saw my works in progress segment they aren't completely finished so next time I see you not only will those socks be finished I'm hoping that my February socks will also be finished and I do plan on casting on another project between now and then so whatever that's neither here nor there we can we can pretend you know here's the one that is finished and you can imagine what the other one would look like together this is ridiculous what am I even doing right now it's not finished who cares I don't know if you can hear that. That is my son and my husband, and my husband's pushing my son in his little push car, and that's the sound that it makes when it's on the sidewalk path, and they just went walking by. And that's really sweet. So anyway, I don't have my socks here for the finished object segment, but that's okay. I have my hat, which as you've, you've seen it this whole time. So my hat is finished. And then I also have some yarn that I wanna share with you guys that I dyed at Vogue Knitting Live. So I took a class at Vogue Knitting Live that dealt with hand dyeing yarn using natural dyes. I was really excited to take this class because I've been really interested in getting into naturally dyeing yarn in addition to using, you know, acid dyes that I use now. And so this was kind of just a really cool uh, jumping off point into that. And I actually have some footage from the class, which I'll share with you here.
This is a skein of yarn that I dyed using some of the natural dyes that Rhonda introduced us to. So I'll show you the yarn and then I'll tell you what I used. So here is my skein. There are lots of colors going on here, but some are much more muted than others. So I'll do my best to kind of point out which is which. Now let's start with this beautiful blue color. This is indigo. Um, we used foam paintbrushes and the indigo was, the dye was mixed with water and it was in little jars on the tables. And so this is our indigo here. And then this purple that you're seeing right here, this is logwood. Um, on the most recent episode of the Dunkelgrun podcast, Anna actually shows a skein, a couple skeins of yarn that are dyed using logwood, and the color that it produces, especially in her case, was a beautiful lavender purple color, and this is supposed to kind of have that purple hue to it, but you know, depending on how much you use, how little you use, you're going to get a different um, effect. So this logwood does produce a purplish um, hue, but in this particular case, it's a little bit more of a gray purple. Um, I don't know if it, yeah, it's, it's kind of just more of a gray color in my case here. So that's that. And then also right here, you can see some pink that's twisted into the yarn. That was dyed using cochineal, which is um, a dye that's produced from the carmine beetle. And that was a really interesting process. I don't have any pictures of that, um, but the carmine beetle, and when you get the cochineal dye, it's just little, little tiny dried beetles that when mixed with hot water, produce this really bright red liquid. And that is, you know, that's what you use to dye your fiber. I'm really, really excited to get into cochineal dyeing. Um, I went on Amazon. I do notice that Jacquard sells the cochineal beetles um, whole that you can um, have sent to you and you can use those to dye. So I am pr planning on getting some of those to start kind of experimenting with that dye. You don't have to grind them up. And I think that's, I know that sounds very barbaric to say that, but I, I was under the impression that you had to like grind them with a pestle and mortar to produce a powder and then use the powder to create a dye. Um, but you don't have to do that. So the way that raw Rhonda did it was that she took the little beetles, put them into a cup, added the hot water, produced the dye right there. And so you just kind of strain that into a separate container and you paint it onto the yarn. And it produced this really pretty um, pink. Now, some people were using much more dye to saturate their colors. Um, and so their cochineal dyed yarn was much more vibrant than mine. So it can, it can definitely produce a range of values of that color. So it's really neat. Um, the other colors I have here, and again, they're super muted. I guess I just didn't go big. Um, right in here, there's a little bit of a yellow hue, but that is marigold. And quite literally, marigolds, dry marigolds were used. Um, they were kind of smashed up, put in the bottom of a cup, some hot water was added, and we painted it on the yarn. And that created this, oh, and here's another more bright patch of that marigold right here. The only thing that we did do, obviously, you have to soak the yarn in a mordant, and the mordant that was used here was alum. And alum is a substance that can be purchased at the grocery store. It's just a mordant like citric acid is when you're dying with acid dyes. But we had to soak the yarn in that first um, before adding these dyes and that's what helps the color stick to the fiber. So anyway, it was a really cool experience and I'm, I'm happy with the results in this particular skein. Not really sure what I'm planning on doing with this yet. It's very gentle, very subtle and very pretty. The second skein of yarn that I have from that class is one that um, was dyed using indigo, but it's so incredibly muted that I don't know if it's really, I don't know if I'm going to keep it or if I'm going to die over it to be completely honest because it is so muted. So I'll just go ahead and show you. You can tell me what you think. I'm not going to do anything hastily, but this is it. It still retains a lot of its ecru qualities. And you know, as I'm looking at it on the screen, I'm thinking that if I saw this yarn on a podcast, I would think it's quite pretty. But this is an indigo dyed yarn, so you can definitely see the blue hues coming through the ecru color. It is, you know, it is really pretty. I don't know, I don't know what to do, guys. Let me know what you think. I mean, yeah, it's pretty. Maybe some speckles would look really cool, but I almost feel like if I add acid dye speckles, I'm tainting the naturalness of this. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, so this is, um, this is an indigo dyed skein, and... 
It's lovely. It was awesome to kind of go through the process of doing this. Um, I definitely would love to dye with indigo in the future. So just one step in the natural dyeing direction that I'm definitely planning on taking. If you have any tips on dyeing with natural dyes, any methods that you use, share them here, please. Just comment down below, let me know. It, let me know what you think I should do with this. I mean, I don't know. I'm not in any hurry to do anything with this skein. I'm keeping it as like a souvenir, but let me know if you think I should add some speckles, maybe over dye it, or just keep it the way it is for posterity. First naturally dyed skeins, and definitely not my last. Okay, so I have so much in the way of acquisitions to share with you. Quite the yarn haul from Vogue Knitting Live. And I didn't go into the marketplace thinking, I'm just gonna go blow a bunch of cash on yarn from places I've never heard of. Vogue Knitting Live and the marketplace is quite an experience. If you go into it for the first time, not having any expectations, it's still very overwhelming. I didn't know where to start. I didn't have any kind of trajectory that I planned on taking. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have a shopping list. Um, I just was gonna kind of go and explore and see what I could find. And it was a lot of fun, but in the beginning it was overwhelming. So I almost had to do that. You know, like when you go to a party, you kind of circle the room before you establish like the place where you wanna hang out. Anybody who's familiar with Clueless will know exactly what I'm talking about. But that was kind of the approach that I took. So I started by just wandering the marketplace, looking at things, not really committing to any particular stall until I knew kind of what was available to me. And then I went around again and slowed down a little bit and maybe like stepped into a few of the stalls to peruse the merchandise and I thought that was a good tactic but it didn't you know cure the overwhelming feeling that I had it was it was a joy regardless so I have some things that I want to share with you from that but before I jump into the items that I purchased at Vogue Knitting Live I want to share with you some special items that were given to me while I was there now if you follow me on Instagram you may already know this but I ran into the lovely ladies from the girls in the yarn cafe Tristan and Christy Tristan is on Instagram as dragon horde yarn she has her own Etsy business where she sells hand dyed yarns which is called dragon horde yarns and then christy has her own etsy business as well where she does hand dyed yarn her etsy shop is called yarn cafe creations and upon meeting these lovely ladies they provided me with with some of their creations as gifts and so i want to share those with you guys the first is a skein from yarn cafe creations which is christy and this is called avalon and it's gorgeous it's got this stormy kind of moody effect to it. I love it. I love the gray. I love this beautiful brown and purple speckling that's going on. So this is Yarn Cafe Creations in Avalon, the Avalon colorway, and it's beautiful. I'm not exactly sure what the base is, but it's so soft and lovely. I love it so much, and I can't wait to use this um, in one of my future projects. I'm not exactly sure what I'm gonna use it for yet, but I know it's going to be special. Christy, thank you so much. I love it so much. She also gave me a sample of another really lovely color. Um, it is this beautiful sunny yellow. This is her duckling colorway. And it's just so pretty. I love it. It's very good for spring. Very appropriate name for this particular colorway. So yeah, that is the duckling colorway. So thank you for that as well. And then Tristan, as soon as I sat down at the table, she handed me three minis that are just samples of some of her colorways. She didn't give me any colorway names. She just gave them to me and said that they were some samples from uh, various different collections that she's done over time, which was awesome. But these are the minis. And I believe she said that this was called Sky Blue. I can't remember what the colorways were. She said they didn't really have official colorways, um, that she wasn't selling these particular colorways, but that she gave them to me as a sample of her work. And I love it so much. This just is one of the things about this community that I love so much is being able to share, you know, tangible artifacts of what we do and of our creative process. And so Tristan, thank you so much. These are beautiful. Your yarn base is so squishy and soft. If you guys haven't checked out Dragon Horde yarns, you definitely need to. Tristan's a magician. Christy is a hand dyeing magician. Look at this. Lovely. So Yarn Cafe Creations, Dragon Horde Yarn. 
mother, daughter, the girls in the yarn cafe, everything about it is just awesome. These ladies are just lovely, amazing, inspiring ladies that have the sense of humor and the personalities to boot. And I just had such a great time hanging out with them. We hung out for the majority of Vogue Knitting Live, to be honest, when we had the opportunities. I was taking some classes. We took, we did one lecture together and we went to dinner at Olive Garden and we just hung out and it was really, really cool. We got to know each other and we just struck up a friendship that I know is going to be a lasting friendship. So that was really, really exciting. So Christy, Tristan, I can't wait to do it again. Um, as you know, I have plans to head up your way in May, so I can't wait to see what happens then. Okay, the next yarn that I purchased came from Forbidden Woolery. Um, amazing yarn. When you walk by this particular stall, it just pops out because the colors are gorgeous. The yarn is luscious. And this is one of the skeins that I purchased. It is in the Basilisk colorway. It is a 70-20-10 combination of superwash merino, nylon, and stellina. So this is 10% stellina. Now she has this created for her in this combination at the mill where she gets her fiber. Typically when you get a sparkly yarn, it has 5% stellina. This is double that. But what's really cool about this is that though it's super sparkly in the skein, when you see it knitted up, the sparkle in the fabric is very subtle. About two skeins of this thinking that I would turn it into a shawl. Um, so here are the two skeins together. They match pretty well. I kind of went through them carefully to find two that matched, you know, as well as I could possibly get them. Obviously knowing that whenever you buy hand dyed yarn, there is no way that any two skeins are going to match perfectly, which is the beauty of the process, the beauty of the business, um, the beauty of that craft. But just, you know, that's just what I did. So that is Basilisk. Um, by Forbidden Woolery. And it's just a fingering weight yarn. It's 495 yards, four ounces. So it is just your basic sock yarn base, but the base itself is definitely not basic. That 702010 is super special and it's very nice and soft. The next skeins that I picked up are also two of uh, two identical skeins. And the color is like I had a color palette in mind when I was looking for yarn, but it is um, from Jade Sapphire Exotic Fibers, and this is a 55% silk, 45% um, cashmere two-ply yarn, and it's gorgeous. It does have a similar color palette to the previous yarn I just showed you, but I could not resist. It is so soft. You can imagine how soft it is. It has this gorgeous luster. The colorway is called Caribbean Mist. And the reason I picked those skeins up was because I saw it um, knit up in a sample for this pattern. It's called a summer ponchette. And what I loved about this was the way that this particular ponchette looked over a black long sleeve t-shirt that I was wearing. It was kind of a more um, close fitting long sleeve t-shirt with a crew neck. And I tried this on over the top of that and it looked so nice. You know, it didn't seem like a shawl would seem as like an accessory. It seemed like a very minimal um, accessory. I guess it's still an accessory, but it seemed very minimal. Very soft and flowy. It just really added something to what I was wearing. Long sleeve black crew neck t-shirt with black jeans and the pop of color was just really, really pretty. As soon as I tried it on, I kind of started imagining what it would look like with other things and I just, I was inspired. I needed something else that I could knit over the summer that would be kind of lightweight and flowy and this was it. So the knitting pattern is by Nancy Ritchie. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. I'm not exactly sure, but this is who the pattern is by. It is published by Getting Pearly With It. So it is Getting Pearly With It presents summer Ponchette, a sheer and flowy piece, a knitting pattern by Nancy Ritchie. And so, yeah, with this shawl and this yarn, I was super inspired. And that is going to be another work in progress coming very soon. I'm almost thinking that when I get done with my stripey socks, that I'm going to cast onto this sucker because it's just so beautiful. And this yarn is so soft. I did pick up some useful items that I can add to my tool bag um, while I was at the marketplace. And one of them is this highlighter tape. So I'm gonna turn it this way so you can see. This is highlighter tape and it serves the same purpose that a highlighter would serve really, um, but it's really, really great for using on charts. And I was working on my exploring in the woods hat at, while I was at Vogue Knitting Live and I was using a chart because that was all the pattern had was a chart. and 
when I was sitting with the ladies from the Girls in the Yarn Cafe, Christy mentions to me using highlighter tape for your charts. Because typically what I do is I'll lightly color over the rows that I've completed with one color of a crayon. And then the next time around I go to repeat the chart, I do another color and, and then that's that. But then it kind of renders your chart unusable for future you know, knits if you plan on repeating it. But this tape is really cool because you can stick it to the paper. So I'll just show you, you can stick it to paper like that wherever you want it to kind of like highlight whatever row you're on. And then you just have to peel it off like this and then you can stick it in other places and it sticks just as well. I don't know if that demonstration was even like worth it to be completely honest, but if you haven't tried highlighter tape for your charts, um, give it a shot. It got me through my whole hat and it worked great. I used two, two pieces of highlighter tape for the entire project because one kind of got like the color started to rub off whatever, but it's it's excellent for that. So if you need a solution for knitting charts and keeping track of where you are, highlighter tape is definitely one solution. Then I also picked up the sock ruler. I haven't even taken it out of the bag yet. And what it is, is a piece of plastic with units of measure, just like a ruler, that you stick into your sock if you're knitting toe up, and even if you're knitting top down, and it measures out the length of your sock at that point, so that way you don't have to use a little flimsy measuring tape or whatever it is that you typically use to measure your socks. Because as you know, it's kind of hard sometimes you have to roll out the sock and, and put your measuring tape up against the sock, and you never know how accurate that is. And so this is a standard tool for measuring a sock. So it's called the sock ruler. And with that, the other thing that I picked up was a tape measure. My little lamb tape measure broke as I don't know if any other knitters that have tape measures like this have experienced that these suckers, if you pull them too far, they're kaput, they break. You can't get the little tape measure to go back in. It's just done for. So they had these at one of the stalls. And so I picked up one of these for myself and I picked up a little golden cat for my mom. So that is another tool from Vogue Knitting Live. Another thing that I picked up just the other day at Joanne Fabrics was a cutting mat, which I can't show you because it's huge, but it's just one of those, you know, self-healing cutting mats that kind of sharpen your rotary blade as you use it kind of thing. But I also picked up a seam ripper because if you watched my demonstration on how to unzip the seams of a sweater, you saw my little Cheapo Depot pink seam ripper that looked like its days were numbered. I picked up one of these. It is a Singer retractable seam ripper and it has this little lever on it so you can flip open the business end of it then when you're done you can close it and the reason why i chose this was because it was cute and the second reason why i chose it was because that way if i am using the seam ripper and angus is nearby um i can close it and not have to worry too much about him poking his eye out with this he's pretty bright he knows how to do these like little manipulations with his hands so it's probably for naught but whatever it's cute right singer open close seam ripper <laughs> All right, for this segment of the goods, I only have one item I wanna share with you guys. And I discovered this item while I was scouring the internet for little doodads that I can send off for my fiber share partner in addition to the fiber that I send her. These are coffee mugs by a brand called Pithitude. And I believe that the coffee mugs are hand drawn and painted. And then the drawing is put onto the coffee mug by the person who owns the business. These are the funniest coffee mugs I have seen in a long time. And really recently I've kind of developed a penchant for coffee mugs, even though I only have a few. This cat mug that I've got behind me has really got me going on cute coffee mugs. Plus when you watch podcasts, everybody has cute coffee mugs. And so I've been kind of keeping my eyes out for interesting coffee mugs. And these coffee mugs by Pithitude definitely fit the bill. If you guys haven't checked out Pithitude coffee mugs, definitely do it. But I'm gonna attach a little montage of some of the coffee mugs from Pithitude right here. right? Definitely check them out. I think they're worth having at least all of them in your coffee mug collection. <laughs> So 
So before me, I have sitting my purple chunky sweater, which we've talked about over the course of the last every episode that I've done so far. I have it here with me today as a work in progress, but I'm sharing it in this segment because of the fiber that it is made out of. This is the sweater. It is just, it's going to be just your basic top-down raglan chunky sweater. And it's made from fiber that looks like this. It's a beautiful color. It probably looks like a very familiar fiber to you. You've probably seen this on several occasions. This is the Lion Brand Woolies Thick and Quick Yarn um, that we are all so very familiar with. It is inexpensive, readily available, and comes in a large variety of colors. And it is made out of 80% acrylic. <gasps> you know, the word acrylic in the fiber community carries such a um, stigma almost. It gets a bad rap in the fiber community. It's an artificial fiber. It's created from a form of plastic. It's not real wool, but it is so prevalent in commercial yarns. And so I think it's something that I wanted to bring up today because I am using this fiber on one of my projects and I just wanted to open that can of worms, I guess, about the acrylic fiber and its place in this community. I kind of feel like acrylic is like the gluten of the fiber community. It carries, you know, a controversial undertone. And I wanted to bring this up because a few episodes ago I received a comment, or I think it was on Ravelry, it was a message from a viewer and now a friend on Ravelry who was talking about how she has a wool allergy and can't knit with all wool or with most wool blends um, for that reason and so she relies on acrylic yarn and she feels like it's kind of a bummer to share that information because acrylic yarn has such a negative um, connotation and so I just wanted to bring that up and see what you guys thought about it does acrylic yarn deserve the flack that it gets in the fiber community um, I, when I first started knitting, as I'm sure is the case with many um, knitters, we, I started with really chunky yarn and Lion Brand was definitely a go-to. And I know that Lion Brand is still a go-to for many knitters, just as it is with me. I love the yarn that they put out. Even the acrylic blends are beautiful and fun to knit with. But we all started here. There was a place, you know, for us as new knitters here with Lion Brand, with Burnett, with Red Heart, what have you, with any of the, the yarns that you can pick up at Michael's or Joanne Fabrics. And some of us, most of us, if not all of us, still scour those shelves looking for really fun, inexpensive yarn that's not going to blow our budget to knit with. And so I just kind of wondered, you know, I know acrylic is an artificial fiber. I know that it definitely has a carbon footprint when it comes to being produced from a plastic, essentially, but does it really deserve the bad name that it's been getting lately? I have such a hearty appreciation for all natural wool fiber. I do believe that all natural fiber is an important part of any knitter's diet. I think that there is a place for all kinds of fiber in this craft. I do like to purchase all wool blends because I prefer the way that it feels most of the time. I like knowing that what I'm knitting came from an animal. Um, you know, it's kind of that farm to fingers type of mentality. To be completely honest, I don't think that I stray or shy away from acrylic blends because it's not 100% wool. Because I use it. I mean, I'm using it for this project. I have it in my stash. And I just wonder, what is it about acrylic that gets under our skin? If you like the fiber, if it makes your heart sing, Susan, I just said that. But if it is something that brings you joy and you enjoy knitting with it and you love the colors and you love the way it feels in your hands, then knit with it. Who cares what it's made out of? In the case of what we do as crafters and how we work with our hands and create things with our hands and that the way things feel in our hands and look to our eyes and in our mind, is it really that bad to to knit with a fiber made with acrylic if it's something that you just really love if you have anything to say to the matter any comments please comment below i think i'm going to begin opening up a thread for each of the food for thought segments that i bring up in each episode that way if you want to join in on the conversation please do i want it to be something that we can chat about in a forum type situation the ravelry is a really good place for that so please comment below add your opinions below but definitely join the ravelry group and if you do have opinions about this that's awesome because this is what this is all about please join the ravelry group let's have a discussion so this week i just wanted to bring that up does acrylic yarn deserve the flack that it gets because it's artificial <laughs> Thank you.
All right, guys, my time with you is almost up, but before I go, I just wanted to remind you of the local yarn store call to action. What I'm doing is I'm asking for the viewers of the Wool Needles Hands podcast or followers on Instagram or anybody who is participating in this community with this podcast to send me footage of your local yarn stores. I know that seems kind of like a hefty task because we don't always get to the local yarn shops. Um, we don't always have that time. Maybe we don't have one nearby, but if you have something, some place where you get your inspiration, where you buy your yarn where you participate in knit nights or other kind of fiber related community things share that here send those things to me at woolneedleshands at gmail.com so that I can feature them at the end of the show it's just a small um, montage of video clips or photos set to music no sound um, it doesn't have to be anything fancy just Get some footage together of your local yarn store so that I can share it here on the podcast and we can further expand this knitting community that we've created here. We have an international viewership here and I just think it would be so cool to share with you the places where people find their solace and they find their fiber and they find their inspiration in the form of a local yarn shop. I've shared a few local yarn shops from my community in previous podcasts and I have yet to receive anything from viewers. It's kind of a big favor that I'm asking from you here but I'm challenging you. So if you have the wherewithal, if you can get me the footage, please do. I would love to feature it as a little segment at the end of the show. I will keep it completely anonymous if you'd like. Definitely uh, the store name, the business, so we can promote the business. But if you would also like yourself to be attached to that footage, I can add your Instagram account, your Ravelry name, whatever it is that you want. You can just let me know in the email that you send with the footage, but please do. I am reaching out to you asking for that little part of your fiber world um, so we can share it with everybody that is involved in our community here. All right, guys, it's been so nice spending some time with you. But for now, I am signing off. Hopefully you had a very relaxing uh, little bit of time here with me. Maybe you got some work done, some knitting. Maybe you were cooking. Who knows? Whatever it is that you were doing, um, thank you for doing it with me. And I will see you guys in two weeks on episode seven of the Wool Needles Hands podcast. See you later. Bye.